A local paramedic is accused of sexually assaulting a patient in the back of an ambulance. What we know about the case right now at 10. And how a Madison organization changed the face of veteran care forever. We sit down with a founding member of Vets House. Straight ahead. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 10. A Madison paramedic is accused of sexually assaulting a patient in the back of an ambulance. 36-year-old Timothy Ovidal is facing felony sexual assault. Madeline O'Neill, following this story, she joins us live at the Dane County Courthouse with the latest. Maddie? Hi, Eric. Ovidal is out tonight on signature bond. Court ordered here earlier today to stay away from the victim and any work involving health care. Those who worked along with Ovidal say this news is hard to comprehend. Just don't want to hear that about anybody that's on your service or works for you. But, uh difficult situation in a profession known for helping patients. It's tough to hear allegations that one of your own did the opposite. So he's been with us uh, for 13 years and uh, just a real hard vo working volunteer that uh, he'd never expect anything like the what it just uh, found out. Up until two months ago, Chief David Bloom says Timothy Ovidal was a firefighter with the Town of Madison Fire Department. Now he's accused of sexually assaulting a patient on a transport from Janesville to Stoughton in May. According to court documents, the patient says she was strapped to a gurney in a Ryan Brothers ambulance alone with Ovidal. When he groped her, exposed himself to her, and whispered inappropriate things in her ear. The woman told deputies she was too shocked and scared to yell for the female driver. These are all first responders and they have the public's trust, so um, it makes me sad. Mark Cohen, executive director of the Wisconsin EMS Association, says additional staff members could help in situations like this. Three persons on a, on a rig would, be, uh, would help to uh, alleviate some concerns and questions about uh, things that go on in the ambulance. But that can be tough to manage with statewide worker shortages. The other uh, option is uh, I do know of a, a for-profit service in Wisconsin that uses uh, cameras in the back of their ambulance. Probably something that should be considered. In the meantime, Bloom hopes the public won't forget all the good paramedics doing their job. Don't let uh, this one incident uh, cloud the the horizon and says he'll try to use this as a learning experience with his crew. Don't take it lightly. Uh, we take it seriously and we'll learn from it. According to the Department of Health Services, in situations like this, it suspends a person's EMS license pending the results of the court case. Ryan Brothers Ambulance has no comment for us today, and Ovidal has denied these charges to authorities. He's expected in court next month. A former Wisconsin Dairy Princess convicted of killing her ex-boyfriend's fiance will soon be released from prison. That case was featured in the TV movie Beauty's Revenge and aired on NBC and Lifetime. The Wisconsin Parole Commission has granted release for now 50-year-old Lori Esker. She's expected to be released from a Racine County facility tomorrow. Esker convicted in 1990 of first-degree intentional homicide and the death of Lisa Chihaski. The 21-year-old woman was engaged to Esker's ex-boyfriend Chihaski, strangled with a belt in a car in a Rib Mountain Motel parking lot back in 1989. The man who drowned this weekend in the Wisconsin River has been identified as an instructor at Madison College. Ku Her had worked there for the last 30 years. Officials say he was visiting the river this Saturday with family when his children swam out too far. He went out there to save them but drowned. His body was found yesterday about 10 miles down the river. Members of the Spring Green community are continuing their conversation about a proposed dog breeding facility. Tonight, they held a forum, including the American Medical Society, discussing the role of testing on animals in health research. We were not allowed to bring cameras inside, but outside, we heard from people both for and against the idea. We know that so many things can be done in regards to research, whether it comes to DNA typing and stem cell research, um, uh, DNA on chips. There's so many more alternatives that are showing better results. I also have a soft spot in my heart for cardiac research because I lost my dad at age when he was age 50. And um, I support that kind of research. Last week, the town of Spring Green rescinded its recommendation of approval for the facility. 
Turning now to weather, the heat continues. Meteorologist Dana Fulton with our first alert forecast. Dana? It was a warm one outside today. Right now, actually, we have a cold front that's moving in closer. Unfortunately, that cold front not bringing a lot of cool air along with it. Just some showers and thunderstorms into northern Wisconsin. Uh, starting to see a few isolated showers right around Camp Douglas and the Dells. Most of that rainfall, though, falling apart as it does move further south. Right now we're at about 81 in Madison, 77 in Janesville and in Mineral Point, close to 80 in Prairie du Chien. Now as we head into tomorrow morning, plan on our temperatures dropping to the upper 60s, but we're in for another sunny, warm and humid day. That trend is really going to continue as we head towards the end of the week. We'll take a closer look at what's ahead with your 10 day forecast in just a few minutes. Dana, thank you. The Milwaukee Brewers paying tribute tonight to a fallen Milwaukee police officer. Before tonight's game against the Braves at Miller Park, there was a moment of silence for Officer Matthew Rittner, who was killed earlier this year while executing a search warrant. His wife, Caroline, who also threw out the first pitch, was presented with the Rittner jersey that hung inside the clubhouse throughout spring training. Eleven people were injured today when a roof collapsed. This was at a California casino. Happened at Larry Flint's Lucky Lady Casino in Gardenia. Aerial footage appeared to show the collapse occurring in the area of two large commercial air conditioners. Right now, the cause of that collapse is unknown. The man who rammed his vehicle into a group of protesters in Charlottesville two years ago received a second life sentence today. James Fields Jr. killed a woman and injured dozens of others during a white supremacist rally in August of 2017. Today, a Virginia judge upheld a jury's recommendation and sentenced Fields to life in prison plus 419 years. Last month, Fields was also sentenced to life in prison on federal hate crimes. We are now one year away from Milwaukee hosting the 2020 Democratic National Convention. Today, city leaders gave a progress report on preparations. Mayor Tom Barrett says one of the biggest hurdles remaining is a formal security plan. They should know by January what area and what streets will need to be closed off. I understand the Secret Service, their number one concern, number two concern, and number three concern is safety, uh, as it should be. We also want to make sure that businesses and individuals can move around the, the heart of the city as freely as possible. DNC leaders say Milwaukee is ahead on both fundraising and hotel accommodations, but most of the work is still in front of them. There is one area where the city needs to play catch up. That is transportation. Former Republican Governor Scott Walker has a new job. He'll be joining the staff of a conservative student organization serving as its president starting in early 2021. The Young America's Foundation made that announcement today. Walker says the job will prevent him from running for governor or the United States Senate in 2022. 45 years ago, life for veterans looked quite different. That is until a local organization stepped in. Our Amy Reed sat down with one of the founding members of Vets House and shares their story. There was a time Doug Bradley thought Vietnam was the worst thing that happened to him, but now he sees it differently. It, it changed my life. I mean, it, I would never be the person I am having the conversation with you that I'm having, um, having the friends and the impact that I've had, caring about the issues that I care about if it, if it really wasn't for that experience. So basically, I owe it everything. Before he could know that, he first had to come home to this. Veterans were returning to campus, uh, using their GI Bill, trying to get their lives together, and there wasn't a lot of support for them. There wasn't a lot of support for veterans from the war uh, in general. When he saw a couple men try to fix that through the organization Vets House, he wanted to get on board, first directing vets to resources, then placing them in jobs, then becoming the nationwide model for organizations like theirs. We decided that another generation of veterans was not going to have to put up with what we did. It just wasn't fair to them. You could disagree with the war. You could disagree with Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen, wherever you are. But, you know, don't put the burden on the veteran. Through the 45 years, he has a lot of favorite moments, countless veterans and friends that will last a lifetime. But in the course of that, I worked through some of my own stuff. You know, I realized that for me, helping other vets was a way for me to help myself. Now he hopes the work they did won't be forgotten, not just the effect it has, but the reason they did it. It takes more of us. I think it's just beyond thank you for service. It's like, you know, um, how can I help or what do you need? Or do you want to talk about your experiences a way that I can better understand what you've been through? I think we need to do more of that kind of thing. Amy Reed, News 3 Now. This weekend at its 45th birthday party, the group was honored with a commendation from the governor, another honor for their long history of helping others. 
Still ahead tonight, our stretch of hot and humid weather has just begun. Dana will have her extended forecast when we come back. But first, now in its sixth year, how a local nonprofit group is providing some much needed shade for underserved parts of the city. Welcome back. One of Madison's most precious resources, or any city for that matter, is our tree canopy. In recent memory, elm trees and now ash trees have fallen to disease and insects. A nine member urban forestry task force has been looking into how to increase the canopy on both public and private land. Our Mark Kane shows us how the Urban Tree Alliance's Madison Canopy Project is helping that effort one tree at a time. Most summer mornings finds Jeremy Kane at Troy Gardens on Madison's north side watering down trees. Jeremy's the director of the nonprofit Urban Tree Alliance. Its mission is to offer one or two free trees to residents in 18 neighborhoods in Madison and Fitchburg. When we started this program, we did a pretty comprehensive mapping of the city and the canopy coverage and then basically came up with a percentage for each neighborhood and then ranked those. The city of Madison owns and maintains some 100,000 trees along more than 700 miles of city streets and is responsible for hundreds of thousands of other trees located in parks, golf courses and cemeteries. The city maintains somewhere around, it's hard to say, let's just say 15 to 20 percent of the trees in Madison through parks and streets and but the rest of the urban forest, if you think about it as a contiguous body of trees, is is managed by private property owners. And getting new trees onto that private land can be a challenge, especially in some neighborhoods. It's a pretty common national trend to see a correlation between income and canopy coverage. If you look at the neighborhoods that we are working in, you could probably look a little further into it, make an argument that that relationship is there too. And we try to sort of remove some of the barriers that kind of prevent people from 
planting trees, and one of those is cost. Um, another one is basic knowledge about trees in terms of, you know, if you go to a nursery and you see 40 varieties of trees, it can be a little overwhelming to make a decision. Another goal of the Madison Canopy Project is to diversify the canopy to avoid problems like the city experienced with elm and ash trees. We're trying to introduce diversity into the um, forest too. So we don't, for example, plant maple trees. Um, it's not because maple trees are in themselves a problem, but again, if you look at the whole forest, probably somewhere around 40% of the trees are maples. So instead, Jeremy is planting bur oaks and tulip poplars and catalpas. And in this delivery on the city's northeast side, this homeowner is getting a new northern pecan tree. Yeah, that's the nice thing about these smaller trees. I mean, I can kind of be in and out of here in 10 minutes, pretty much. Now in its sixth year, Madison Canopy Project has planted more than 800 trees. You know, there is a little bit of a paradox where people who want trees are often people who like trees, who are people who have trees. <laughs> there are oftentimes homes and neighborhoods where, you, where I would see like a, just a perfect spot for a tree, but obviously the person's got to want one. So we do provide maintenance instructions, particularly watering is the big thing. Um, uh, that's, and then protecting it in the winter time. And just like that, in less than 10 minutes, Madison has a new tree, which in time will ensure a healthy tree canopy made in the shade. Great to go around the city and see some of these trees over the years we've planted yeah. and kind of keep track of them. I'm Mark Kane, News 3 Now, Madison. If you're interested in getting a tree, head to the website urbantreealliance.org and click on the Madison Canopy Project link, and there you'll find a map of neighborhoods eligible and a link to request a tree. Well, trees are going to have to deal with some uh, serious heat. Some of them like it, though. They like the humidity some and the moisture do. in the air, but... Uh, Boy, it's hot and we're heading for more. It's hot, the heat's coming through, and, and as you have said, a lot of trees happy about it, a lot of plants happy about mm -hmm. it. I'm not so happy about mm -hmm. it. I don't think my dog's happy nope, about it. No, mine neither. Nope, nope. Uh, it's going to be very humid for us for the next few days, unfortunately. Now, we did have a really nice evening warm outside, but not too bad. Here's a nice time lapse, actually, of our sunset from our Edgewater Sky Cam. Of course, after sunset, our temperatures have uh, dropped off a little bit for us. Not too much, though. Temperatures are still holding on to the 80s. We did hit a high of 88 today. We should have been in the low 80s. It felt like summer was just a little too much summer. We shouldn't have warmed up quite that much this afternoon with the sunshine. We started the day off in the mid 70s. Overnight, we are going to drop a little more. Uh, we'll fall to the upper 60s, but still very mild and muggy over the next few hours. Looking to the north, there are some showers and thunderstorms right now. That's associated with a cold front. Unfortunately, the showers really breaking apart as they fall southeast. We are seeing a few raindrops falling uh, right around Camp Douglas and the Dells. So I wouldn't be surprised if we do have a few isolated showers. Uh, again, drifting a little further southeast, but not a great rain chance for us. This all associated with a cold front that is moving southeast. Unfortunately, it's also falling apart along with the rains. So we aren't expecting any cool down tomorrow, nor any drop in the humidity. It's going to really stall across the northern Midwest and put us in a little unsettled pattern. That's going to lead to just an increase in our temperatures and increase in humidity over the next few days. Right now we're at 81 in Madison, 73 in Dubuque, a southwest breeze for us. Again, heading into tomorrow morning, those shower chances die down. Partly sunny sky for your Tuesday. And by Wednesday, we're also looking at a partly sunny sky, but a slight chance for a shower possible later in the day. Same goes for Thursday morning, slight chance for showers but Thursday and Friday is going to be hot outside and very humid for the end of the week. Overnight, plan on a partly cloudy sky. We'll be in the upper 60s for overnight lows. Again, uh, partly sunny for Tuesday, but temperatures will be close to 90 for those afternoon highs. And the same goes as we head into Wednesday, another day that's going to be warm outside. Wednesday, though, uh, the good news, if we do have some showers pop on up, that's really going to stop our temperatures. It snuffs them out a little bit, so we only see our highs stop in the mid to upper 80s. Heat index ratings, though, they'll be climbing into the mid to low 90s for Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon and then heading into Wednesday afternoon. Plan on those heat index readings in the mid to low 90s. That's just for Tuesday and Wednesday. The trend continues to warm on up by Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Uh, we are expecting a very hot end to the week. Because of this, we already have an excessive heat watch that has been issued. Not in effect yet. It goes into effect on Thursday, but it's been issued for the southwest corner of Wisconsin. Uh, Grant County included in that stretching west and south under northern Illinois. The uh, Milwaukee uh, National Weather Service office is holding off a little longer just to wait and see how things kind of play out over the next few days. They haven't issued anything for the rest of southern Wisconsin, but it's still going to be hot outside. So that's why we have alert days in the forecast stretching through the rest of the week. Those heat index readings for Thursday, Friday and Saturday 
will be into the triple digits. Overnight low of about 69 in Madison. Tomorrow we're planning on a high of 90. It's going to be very hot and humid outside. Tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and into the weekend. Uh, temperatures will be in the low 90s for Tuesday and Wednesday, mid 90s for Thursday and Friday. By Saturday and Sunday, we're still well above average. Thankfully, heading into next week, we see a little bit of a pullback in the heat. Still a little above average in the mid 80s. We should be in the lower 80s, but mid 80s better than the mid 90s. And uh, heat index readings closer to 90, better than being in the triple digits. Yeah, you got to bear with it. You got to deal with this. It's going to be a hot stretch. It's going to be a hot stretch for us. So uh, we're going to go steady. I think everyone should just uh, be a little slow if they're outside and take some breaks if they can if they have yeah, a lot of outside absolutely. time. Good, good call. All right, Dana, thank mm -hmm. you. Forward, Madison FC hosts the top team from Mexico at Bree Stevens Field tomorrow night. We'll have that story coming up next in sports. Wisconsin. The Atlanta Braves were the Milwaukee Braves until they moved south in 1966. Tonight, the Atlanta Braves are back in Milwaukee, but just for the next three days to play the Brewers at Miller Park. Adrian Hauser gets another start for Milwaukee. He's cruising along until this. Freddie Freeman hits at 424 feet off the scoreboard in center field. That's a three-run shot. That's the difference of the game. The final score is Braves 4, Brewers 2. At Wrigley, the Reds lead the Cubs 6-3 in the ninth. Forward Madison FC has been filling Bree Stevens Field all season long, and tomorrow night it's another sellout as the Flamingos play the Mexican soccer team Leones Negros.
That team features Mexican star Omar Bravo, who's the all-time leading scorer for Guadalajara, with 132 career goals. Madison's Latino community is really going to come out to watch this one, so it's more than just another exhibition match. Any chance you get to host a, an international game in your home stadium in front of your home fans, it's, it's exciting, and uh, it's going to still be a quality match. Uh, they're bringing all their top players, and it should be an exciting night for everybody, and we're looking forward to the game. I think it just, in every game, the fans are just up for anything and they always show our support. So I think it's going to be uh, pretty exciting for, for, for everyone. College football season is basically here. Friday, the Badgers will be in Chicago for Big Ten Football Media Day. The season opener is at South Florida a month and two weeks away. Running back Jonathan Taylor is going to get all sorts of hype this year as a Heisman Trophy candidate. Today, he's named on the watch list for the Maxwell Award as the nation's best player. Taylor needs 2,235 yards to pass San Diego State's Donnell Pumphrey for the most rushing yards in NCAA history. And don't forget, he's only a junior. The Badger men's hockey team is practicing for a road trip to exhibition games at the end of next month against the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Sophomore defenseman Wyatt Kalnick is the only player on the Badger roster who's from Canada, specifically Verdon, Manitoba. Yeah, should be fun. Uh... I'm from Canada, so I'm looking forward to it. Then I can show some of, some of the guys here that maybe don't like Canada as much as America, but uh, it'll be fun. Just how nice it is up in Vancouver and BC, and uh, I'll try to maybe get the guys some poutine. If you play the video game Madden NFL 20, the new player rankings are out. The highest rating for a Packer goes to left tackle David Bakhtiario, gets an overall rating of 97. Wide receiver Devontae Adams ranked ninth at his position. And Aaron Rodgers' rating took a beating. Last year he was 99. That was the best in the game. This year Rodgers down to a 90, the seventh best quarterback in the NFL in the Madden 20 ratings. And Giannis Antetokounmpo is at Yankee Stadium on a Nike promotional trip. They could hardly fit his name on the credential. He hangs out with pitcher CC Sabathia, who's 6'6", 300. Giannis is 6'11", 242. All right, Greek freak gets his first chance at hitting a baseball. Well, you had to figure that was going to happen. So they get a little taller batting tee, and there it is. Giannis is the MVP, but not at baseball. And we'll be right back.
Finally, tonight the U.S. Air Force is warning everyone not to try and raid Area 51. More than a million people in a Facebook group say they want to storm the military base on September 20th in an effort to, quote, see them aliens. The page <laughs> states that the whole thing is just a big joke, but the Air Force is not laughing. It issued a statement saying, quote, we would discourage anyone from trying to come into the area where we would train American armed forces. The mysterious Area 51 has been the subject of conspiracy theories for decades. I'm sure it is quite hot out there. It is certainly hot here as well, and it's going to stay that way for a while. It is. The heat really settling in and staying at least through the rest of the work week and into the weekend. Temperatures will be close to 90 again tomorrow, the low 90s on Wednesday, mid 90s by Thursday, Friday, and Saturday with those heat index readings well over 100, unfortunately, for us. All right, Dana, thank you. Thanks for joining us for News 3 Now at 10. Charlotte's back tomorrow. Have a great night.